So at this point, I'll actually check my extension space to make sure I've taken enough bone, both on the distal femur and on the proximal tibia. This is a nine millimeter spacer block and it has an alignment rod that's attached to it. Uh, so I'll actually place this nine millimeter block into where I made my cut and then I'll bring the knee into full extension and I'll check to make sure it's, it is full extension, which it is. And again, the alignment should be going right down the tibial shaft and aiming towards the second metatarsal, which it also is. So at this point, I'm ready to move on to the distal femur. So I'm going to gain, again, gain a good exposure of the distal femur by placing a retractor around the tibial plateau to help retract the patella. And then medially, um, in this particular case, it's, well, it's exposed well uh, without having to place any retractors. So now I can actually remove my pins because I know my extension space is good. So I won't need to make any more changes to the tibial cut or the distal femur cut. So at this point, I'm going to mark my axes of my femur uh, in order to uh, set my femoral rotation. It's a very critical part of, the, of your um, sizing your femur. So I've marked my AP axis, which is Whiteside's line. Then I'll actually uh, try to mark the transepicondylar axis, which is usually 90 degrees to your AP axis. It's often difficult to actually mark this axis appropriately in the operating room. But that's about the rotation that I want, so that you're perpendicular to white size line. Now I'll actually take the distal femoral sizing guide. It allows me to size both anterior and posterior as well as set my rotation and change the size of the, of the components. And you actually want to size off the uh, lateral side of the femur, of the distal femur. That's the highest side. If you size off the medial side, a lot of times you will end up notching on the lateral side. This guide in particular sits underneath the condyles. And you're going to change the rotation of the guide so that it matches your AP axis as well as your uh, surgical transepicondylar axis. So at this point I like that. It's parallel to the lines that I made. And it looks like I'm sizing a around a size 7. With this particular system, it's a posterior referencing system, therefore the posterior condylar cut is always the same. Your anterior cut will change though. So if you're in between sizes with this type of system, you should try the larger side first just so you don't notch. And then if you, if you can, you can downsize the component. So at this point I'm going to um, make my two holes for my 4-in-1 cutting guide. Again, this is your last chance to check your rotation and make sure you like it before you start cutting it. And I actually do like that. So at this point, I'm going to put my 4 one cutting guide onto the distal femur. I use one side pin to help hold it. And I'll add one extra additional pin. So the first cut I'll actually start to make is the anterior cut. Again, this is the cut that I make first so that if I need to downsize the femoral component, I can. And I'll start always on the medial side. And that cut is perfect to me. I'm right on the anterior cortex. There's no way I can downsize the femur at this point. Once I know I like my size and I like my rotation, the rotation, I could, it, it's called the grand piano sign. The distal femur should look, the anterior aspect of the distal femur should look like a grand piano, which it does. Uh, so I like my rotation. And now I'm ready to complete the remaining cuts on the distal femur. So now I've got the retractors in both medially and laterally. This is a crucial step before you start cutting on the medial side in particular that you don't cut your MCL. Uh, so you want to make sure your retractor is protecting that MCL. Similarly, on the lateral side, you want to make sure you're not cutting your patella or tendon. So at this point, I'm going to start doing my posterior cuts. And once you see the, the uh, bone on the posterior aspect of the femur move, you know you're all the way through. And I'll do my posterior chamfered. And then I'll do my anterior chamfer. Now I've completed all my cuts on my femur. I can use the slap hammer to remove the cutting guide. At this point, you're ready to remove your posterior osteophytes as well as your meniscus. Using the curved osteotome, this will actually help you remove your posterior femoral condyle cuts that you just made. And then with a knife or a bovi, most of the time it's a bovi, given the fact that they're all, all the nerves and arteries in the back of the knee. A lot of times we'll remove this with bovi. Today we'll remove it with a knife. Now I can insert a laminar spreader on both sides in order to remove the meniscus. And then I'll just use this if you wouldn't mind holding this one here. The uh, MCL actually attaches on the medial meniscus. So as you're going around, you can actually see where your MCL is coming in. Uh, so you, as you're taking the, the medial meniscus out, you want to keep an eye on where your MCL is in, inserting onto the meniscus. And at that particular portion, you want to make sure you leave 
a millimeter or two cuff of meniscus so you don't remove the MCL. In order to keep the MCL in tension, a lot of times you can place a coker onto this soft tissue in order to give it some tension. So this is actually the MCL that you're looking at here. By keeping the soft tissues on tension, it allows you to actually see this MCL very nicely coming in and allows you to know where to look for it as you're taking out your medial meniscus. Again, around that area, you want to leave a, a millimeter or two cuff of the medial meniscus so that you don't remove the MCL. So now I'm removing a portion of the uh, medial meniscus. Again, I've got my MCL. I'm looking right at it. I know where I need to take, leave a millimeter or two of cuff. So as I'm going around, I'm going to leave a millimeter or two cuff of medial meniscus right at that area of the MCL, then for the rest of it I can just remove the entire medial meniscus. Now I would check to see if there's any posterior osteophytes in, in the back of the knee. Or, uh, in, that, in this particular case, there's not many osteophytes. She didn't have much more arthritis. So actually move down to the lateral side, laminar spreader on the medial side, and again I get the same view. So for this particular case, I'll pick, I'm able to pick up my meniscus. Now th there's a uh, hiatus between the lateral meniscus and the popliteus called the popliteal hiatus. It allows you to protect your popliteus as you're coming around the back of the knee. So that's the popliteal hiatus. You've got popliteus behind you here. Uh, and the meniscus separates from the popliteus. And you're able to remove the entire menis lateral meniscus. And again, at this point I would check to see if there is any osteophytes. And either using a curved osteotome and or a curette, you're able to remove the posterior osteophytes so that's nice and smooth in the back of the knee. Now I've completed my femur, I will check now my flexion gap to make sure I like uh, my fle flexion space and I like my overall alignment. At this point we can remove the spreaders. So at this point I'm going to check my flexion space. So again I insert my 9 millimeter spacer block and I want to check this at 90 degrees of flexion and again I want the drop rod to come right down the tibial shaft along the second metatarsal which it does very nicely. Now at this point I'm going to move on to the tibia and I'm going to size the tibia and prepare the proximal tibia. So I can take a, a thin bend homen around the back of the knee and really sublux the tibial plateau gives me a, the best sizing. I'm going to move this retractor so I can see laterally. At this point you can use a curette or a ranger to clean out the lateral side, any bone that you might have missed on the lateral side of the knee. Now my entire tibial plateau is exposed and I'm ready to size it. So now I'm ready to set my tibial rotation. Uh, usually what you, I'm aiming for is I want uh, the tibia to be rotated so it sits on the middle third of the tibial tubercle. So at this point I like my rotation, I'm able to see the tibial tubercle very nicely. Um, and the sizing I think is appropriate. You always want to double check to make sure there's no overhang on both the medial or the lateral side. And you can either use a cushing or a knife just to make sure you still have bone on the lateral side. So now I'm ready to pin this into position. Now I'm ready to complete my tibia. This is the last time you have to check your uh, a cut before you prepare it. So we'll, get, we'll give this one more cut and again I like where, where my alignment rod is going right down the shaft of the tibia plateau. Right down the shaft of the tibia. Now I'm going to drill the proximal tibia and I'll then complete it with the punch. Then I'll remove this, use this lap hammer to remove. At this point my tibia is done and I'm ready to then make the notch cut for the distal femur. You can remove that. So this is the notch cutting guide that's placed on the distal femur. Again, you usually want to line, uh, center the, this alignment, this uh, box cutting guide as best you can. If anything, you want to cheat laterally as lateral position of the component will help your patellar tracking. So I like that fit. I'm not overhanging on the medial side. And it's nice and flush on the lateral side too. Now for this particular box cutting guide, You use a reamer as well as a chisel to complete the box. Every, every system is different.
then the chisel is used to complete it. Yeah, the slap hammer. Now your box is completed. You can take an osteotome at this point to remove any excess bone and soft tissue. And as long as you stay with inside the femur, the risk of you cutting the artery in the back is very low. So I'm staying inside the femur, not diving way in the back. And then again, most of the time this is removed with the use of a bovie. So now I've completed my box cut. Uh, this is again for a posterior stabilized knee. Now I'm ready to insert my trial insert. I start with the smallest polyethylene that I can. That will give me good stability. And you can come out with that. A lot of times you have to bring the knee into extension to get it to click into place, which it does there. Now I like it. I've got full extension. And then when I flex the knee up, I've got great flexion. And the patella is tracking well without any patellar component. So I know with the patellar component, it will track even better. So at this point, I'm going to finish my patellar cut. Again, I use the same exposure that I did before with uh, two cokers that are placed around the patella, one in the patellar tendon and one just grabbing a small portion of the quadriceps tendon. And then also a sweetheart that goes on the other side. And the sweetheart is usually your, your main retractor that allows you to evert and control the patella. I've got a little bit more cartilage uh, and it's a little thick on the lateral side, so I'm just going to complete this uh, cut here. Now I like that much better. Now I'm ready to size the patella component. This particular patella sizes nicely to with a 32. And that you want to cover as much as you can superior to inferior, but if anything, you want to place your patellar component more on the medial side of the patella. This again helps with patellar tracking. And now I'm ready to drill my holes in the patella. And the patella is now prepared. This is my final check to check for patellar tracking and all the retractors can now be removed. Now I'm going to place my patellar button into position and check the final tracking. At this point I'm going to flex up the knee and the patella is tracking nicely without any sort of holding the patella over to the side. So I like, I like my patellar tracking. If I didn't at this point I could do a lateral release um, or you can always test it with the soft tissues back onto the patella using a sweetheart to see whether or not that's able to bring the patella over by itself. And that's the total knee. So at this point I check my stability, bit nice and stable when I'm stressing the medial side, nice and stable when I'm stressing the lateral side, and when I flex it up, excellent patellar tracking, excellent flexion, and very nice stability and flexion as well. Thank you very much, I'm Michael Cross, an assistant attending at the Hospital for Special Surgery in the Department of Joint Reconstruction and Joint Replacement.